Good morning. So right now I'm going to show you a couple of things. The first thing I'm going to show you is how to do the Excel processing to get the graph um, that you may have already done on your own. So you can just fast forward this part if you'd like to. And then I'm going to review actually why the graph looks the way that it does based on the mathematical relationship that we're seeing. So we'll derive that equation that actually represents your graph. So first thing is first is I'm going to show you in Excel because that's the program that I like, but it works just as well in Google Sheets. OK, now you're seeing it. Um, so going to the Excel spreadsheet, um, here's the radius and here's the revolutions. Um, what I'm going to do first is I'm actually going to create a column right next to the time for 10 revolutions, which is just the time for one revolution. And in order to get that, that would just be taking 10 and dividing by the time that it took. And so really, I guess this isn't um, time for one revolution, it's rather one over that time. So I'll change my title there in a second. So this is actually one rev per time. Um, and the little Excel tricks there are first just putting in the equation. So I put in 10 dividing by the value that I'd like to divide by. And then um, I can't remember how I showed you this, but I, I sometimes use this drag down or sometimes you can just double click it or copy paste. Um, so it's done all the calculations for me. And then the next step would be to put this into the velocity. So um, and I guess I'll call it the average velocity of stopper as it's going along that path. So as I talked about in the previous video, to get that velocity, we have to do 2 times pi times r, and the radius is over here, so I can select that here. I didn't mean for that to calculate yet. You go back here, um, times that one. So we've got 2 times pi times r, um, so that's going to be the total distance that it travels and then divided by, or actually here I can multiply by the time um, because I already have it in one over um, the time. And let me just think about if I did that correctly. So I took 10 revolutions divided by that time. So that's the one over time. And then, yeah, I just want to multiply by that. And this is kind of doing it in a dimensional analysis format. So there's our velocity, and I'm just doing that for every um, trial here or every data point that I want. And you'll notice that we need the R to be specific to um, that trial. And I will add in that the units here are in meters per second because my um, circumference was calculated in meters because I'm using an R in meters, and then my time, this is in really one over seconds. The units here would be seconds to the negative one. Um, and so when I multiply those together, I get meters and then over seconds. OK, so there are the velocities. The next step is just to graph this. So um, to graph in Excel, we can go to insert and then choose just a scatter plot. Um, it looks blank right now because we haven't told it what columns we want to graph yet. To do that, you can right click and then choose select data. We don't have any series in here right now, so we want to say add. And then this first um, little text box is just where you can put a name for the series if you like. Since we're only doing one pair of values, I'll just leave it blank. So for the X values, I want the X values to be my radii, how the radius was varying, my um, independent or controlled variable, or rather um, my manipulated variable. And then for the Y values, I'm looking at the velocity. There we go. So we can just say OK there. And here's that graph. Let's add some titles so that we keep in mind what we're graphing. We have the radius in meters and the average velocity. The reason I'm saying average is because um, it could be changing its speed slightly 
um, as it's going in that circle, but really we're taking the average if we're looking at the whole circumference. And then I'm just going to title it the rubber stopper lab. Okay. All right, so looking at this graph, um, you may have gotten to this point on your own. Um, this part, if I was just looking in this section, right, it kind of looks linear there, but one of the um, key things when you're doing a lab is you want to make sure you hit kind of the extreme ends of um, your data range. So we want to make sure we have plenty of points in this low radius data range because we can actually see there's definitely some curvature here. And this, um, you might have noticed, actually is a square root function. Um, so we will fit a line to that and we'll see that it indeed fits a square root function. Um, the other thing that we could do is we could linearize it, which we've done previously, but we're going to skip that for this lab. So if I want to add a, um, a trend line to this, a couple ways to do it. Um, one way is to click on the data so they're all highlighted and then right click and you can say add trend line. That will pop up this um, sidebar here so we can, I mean, we could also have clicked through here and really seen which one seems to fit it best. There you can really see the linear isn't um, a very good fit, logarithmic, not really, polynomial getting closer, but then when we go to the power, um, it really fits. And then the little trick here is to make sure that you select um, display equation on chart. And if you like to, you could also select um, the R value. And we've got a really good R value here. Um, and that may, just means that the correlation is pretty much perfect here. Um, and for those of you taking statistics, you'll have a better understanding of what that R value really means. But the closer to one it is, the better the fit. Um, so let me just make this a little bit bigger for us so we can really look at that equation. Um, and so just like I was saying is that when we look at the power function, um, this actually is a square root because we're raising x to the 0 0.5 or the 1 half power. Um, so this indeed is a square root function. So as the radius increases, we see that the average velocity also increases, but it's not increasing at a linear rate. Um, it kind of slows down that increase as the radius gets larger and larger. And what I'm going to show you next is deriving that algebraically using going back to kind of our pre lab questions and looking at the force that's causing the centripetal motion here and relating that to the velocity and the radius. OK, so in the pre lab, I asked you to draw your free body diagrams on the hanging mass and also the rubber stopper. So let me just draw what's happening here again. We have um, the fishing line that hooks onto a mass. So I'm going to label this as the mass. And then up here, it goes through a hollow tube, which is a um, straw that's um, pretty rigid. And then um, it's ends up taking this turn because of the um, circular motion. So here's my stopper. And the whole reason that the mass doesn't accelerate towards the earth is because the stopper is in motion, it's also e exerting um, tension this way. And in turn, that means that the mass has a tension force on it that's pulling the mass upwards, that's counteracting its gravitational force downwards. So those two things are going to be equivalent to each other. Since you saw that the mass doesn't accelerate towards the Earth, the forces have to be balanced. And then back in our forces lab, or um, forces unit, we actually realized that the tension along a string is the same everywhere. So the tension that's pulling this mass up has to actually be the exact same as the tension that's pulling the rubber stopper at, along whichever direction the rubber stopper is being pulled as it's rotating. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. And we're looking at this um, rubber stopper kind of just head on um, as if you have the camera looking at it and the person is standing vertically just facing the camera. If we look at that rubber stopper, it really takes a bit of a, it has a bit of an angle to it. 
realistically um, as it's going in this circle. So it's coming out of the top of the straw right here. And then it's going in a circle around that point. But the string is always at a bit of an angle. So the true free body diagram on the rubber stopper would look something like this, where remember tension has to pull exactly along the same direction as the string. So the tension's at a slight angle here. This is FT. Um, that's equivalent to the tension pulling up on the mass. And then if this were the case, the rubber stopper would have this inward seeking force that's causing it to rotate, but it would also um, be accelerating upwards. So there's definitely still a gravitational force going downwards, FG, um, on the stopper by the earth that counteracts the vertical tension here. So we've got um, this tension acting at an angle. So there's FTY up and FTX down. The um, force that causes the stopper to move in a circle is going to be this FTX. So the centripetal force, FC, is the FTX, the horizontal here. Okay, so let's now connect this to what we saw in the data. So the data showed us that when we look at the... Um, stopper's velocity versus the radius of its circle that it was taking. Um, it follows this square root type of relationship, and we're just going to show why that is, theoretically, um, based on some algebra, algebra here. So we know that Fc, um, a centripetal force, is always equal to, I don't know, I'm going to run out of lead. So Fc is really a net force, so it for any mass, it will cause it to accelerate. And we're dealing with centripetal acceleration where it's changing its direction. And then we know that centripetal acceleration is given as the velocity squared divided by the radius of the turn. So Fc is always equal to the mass that's turning times its velocity squared divided by r. Um, and we know that Fc was equal to Ftx. Now this Ftx is the same for all um, radii. And I can justify that to you real quickly here. Um, Ftx is this horizontal component. So if I look at the triangle, here is Ft, here is Fty and here's FTX. Um, FT, we realized, is equal to the gravitational force um, on the mass by the Earth, and that's just gonna be equal to the, the mass that's hanging times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So that's constant, because I never changed the mass. FTY, well, that's just equivalent to the gravitational force on the hanging mass, so that's gonna be equal to the hanging masses, I'm just going to call that little m because I used big m then, there, times 9.8 uh, newtons per kilogram. So um, in the triangle, if these two sides never change, the hypotenuse and this um, one side length, that means that FTX is always the same. So this is just a constant for the whole um, experiment here. FTX never changes. I'd also say that the mass that's hanging or the of the rubber stopper never changes so that's also constant and then the two things that were changing were our velocity and the radius and this one is the one that we were really manipulating so we forced that one to change and then this one responded so just looking at the equation we have here um, if these things are constant then it seems like if the radius changes, in order for FTX to always be the same value, um, the velocity has to change there. And um, if, let's say, the radius is getting larger, you can tell that if I increase the denominator, the numerator would also have to increase, but it's not increasing by one to one because the velocity is squared. So let's just do a little bit of um, rearrangement to see the equation that would fit our graph.
So we're trying to basically get something in terms of y, where y is my velocity, is equal to something times x, and really it's probably going to end up being square root of x, because that's the um, function, the pattern nature that we're seeing here. So I'm going to go back to um, rewriting this. We've got ftx is equal to mass times velocity squared over r. So we've got um, times r on both sides so that r cancels out right here, making 1. So we have r times ftx is equal to m times v squared. I want v to be on its own, so I'm going to divide by m here so that the m makes 1 here. And I have r times ftx over m is equal to v squared. And then I want to um, have v on its own, so I'm going to square root it on both sides. And so I end up with, and I'm just going to do a little bit of a rearrangement. So I have ftx over m times the square root of r, just kind of taking the square root in different portions of my full quotient there, is equal to v. And then let me just kind of flip this so it's in the same orientation as I have right here. I have v is equal to square root of ftx over m times square root of r. So sure enough, um, in terms of the relationship between v and r, it follows this square root function, but this is our constant value that doesn't actually change here. The reason that I'm showing you this derivation is that I want you to do this same type of process, but for considering the orbital motion of planets. The difference there is that this FC is not tension when we're talking about orbital motion um, of the planets, right? We've realized that, that the centripetal force that causes the planets to rotate um, when we're talking about orbital motion, FC is equal to the gravitational force between the mass that's rotating and the mass at the center. So if we're talking about the Earth rotating around the sun, then this um, gravitational force would be, you know, the gravitational constant and then mass of the Earth times mass of the sun divided by their separation distance squared. The difference here being that this radius not only appears in um, the centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, but it also appears in, in the um, equation for the force. So the gravitational force, we realize, actually changes with distance. Um, and so this re relationship holds for situations where the centripetal force isn't um, gravitation, but when it's the gravitational force, there's going to be a slightly different relationship, and I want you to think about predicting that. All right, that's it for today. I miss you all. Have a great day.